So hello everyone. Um, please give us a minute or two um, once uh, people have joined, popped off their previous calls or whatever it is that they were doing, then we'll we'll start. So we'll start in a minute or two. Bear with us. Okay, uh, so it looks like people are joining. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I think we'll we'll start now. Um, I just scanned through the attendee list. There's some very, very familiar names there. So welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. As always, um, same format, right, for these sessions. A uh, couple of minutes housekeeping from me, and then I'll hand you over to our guests. Uh, the session typically lasts around 60 minutes, so we'll have about 45 minutes with our guests and then we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, if you'd like to ask either FNA or one of our guests a question, please do so, don't be shy. Uh, but I do ask that you use the uh, Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, don't use the chat. If you just want to say hi to everybody, use the chat, but if, you want, uh, if you'd like to add a, a question to the Q&A session at the end, use the Q&A widget so that it's easier for us to track. Um, all of the inbound questions, but thank you. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who perhaps aren't as familiar um, with f &A, um, maybe it's your first session, I'll just explain very quickly what it is that we do. So we are an advanced analytics and simulation technology company. Uh, we work across four, uh, four core sectors, uh, so namely central banks, commercial banks, FMIs, um, and national security organizations. So as you can probably see from the slide, uh, we worked with a wide range of companies across those sectors. Next slide, please. Related to this, uh, FMIs, Challenger FMIs, um, large value payment systems use our FMI lifecycle solutions to support every stage of their journey. So whether that's designing um, and validating initial system design, um, building business cases for their members, everything right through to monitoring, stress testing, and optimizing their systems. So we've been lucky to work with some phenomenal FMIs, payment systems. Over the years, um, we're seeing an increase, as you would imagine, in challenger FMIs as well, new platforms, new technologies. Um, some of this work can be found on our case study section on the website if you're interested. So um, on to onto the discussion. I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Carlos Leone, who works here at FNA as Director of FMI and Digital Currency Solutions. Um, he'll be familiar to you if you've joined previous sessions. Um, he'll then introduce our speakers and then we'll get the discussion kicked off. So, Carlos, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, good morning, uh, good uh, afternoon to everyone, depending on the part of the globe you are at. Today we have two uh, guest speakers. Great two, great two speakers, Keith Bear and Philip NS. Keith is fellow at the Center of Alternative Finance, Judge at Judge uh, Business School University of Cambridge, and Philip, its Executive Director of Business Development at JP Morgan. So thank you both for joining us. I'm sure that we're going to have a very, very interesting and joyful conversation about uh, tokenized deposits. That's our main topic today. Keith, Philip, welcome. Thank you, Carlos. And thank you, Carlos, for myself. Thank you, Philip. So uh, I think we can start with just a very brief summary of what we're going to talk about today. So as I mentioned, it's about tokenization. Tokenization is a buzzword nowadays. We hear about tokenization everywhere. 
it seems that everything can be tokenized from securities to real estate, from commodities to equity. Recently, and I think it's apparently as an answer to retail CBDCs and stablecoins, tokenized bank deposits have also emerged as a new form of money based on commercial bank money. Today, we're going to discuss the motivations, benefits, challenges, and main issues that arise when tokenizing bank deposits. Obviously, as this is the FMI broadcast, we will discuss how the issues of tokenized deposits, namely licensed depository institutions, could become challenger FMIs aimed at the issuance of a new form of money. To this end, as I already mentioned, we have invited two outstanding speakers, Keith Baer and Philip Enes. Together, we're going to navigate this very new tokenization of deposits topic. So once again, Keith and uh, Philip, welcome. I don't know if you want to make any statement before we start, or can I start with our first questions? <laughs> You're welcome to start with your first questions from my point of view. And mine as well. Okay, let's start. So just, just to have like a, a friendly introduction, can you both uh, tell us a little bit about your work at the Center of Alternative Finance in the University of Cambridge at the JP Morgan, respectively. Kim. Sure, no problem. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to the webinar as well. Uh, so, yes, I've been a fellow at the Center for Alternative Finance uh, at Cambridge uh, for the last four years or so. Um, as you might know, we have a reputation for uh, the work we've done on crypto asset industry surveys and in particular the Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index, which is, uh, I think, a world renowned source of information in terms of both uh, electricity and now greenhouse gas emission for the Bitcoin network. Uh, and about a year ago, we launched our digital asset research program, which is um, sponsored and supported by 15 institutions around the world, both public and private, uh, including the likes of Goldman Sachs, Fidelity Digital Assets, um, MSCI, Invesco, Mastercard Visa, and then on the public side, the World Bank, IMF, the BIS Innovation Hub out of Hong Kong, and also the DIFC. And also, I should say, the UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. Uh, so within that, we have three major research streams. The first is focused on uh, the climate impact of digital assets. The second around distributed financial market infrastructure. And the third relevant to this discussion is uh, digital money. And we're moving away from academic reports, 100 page academic reports, uh, to try and uh, further develop what we started off with uh, Bitcoin in terms of digital tools to be able to provide greater insight and understanding of what's happening in the industry. So in the context of digital money in this discussion, our focus is on currently building a digital money dashboard to be able to show uh, both educate people as to the different forms of digital money, be it stable coins, CBTC, or in this context, tokenized bank deposits, um, to see how they're being used, where they're being used, um, understanding the flows, the velocity, the uh, metrics, et cetera, along those lines, with an initial focus on stable coins, because that's obviously the easiest uh, place to start. Uh, but looking to add in, uh, and hopefully Phil can help us on this, uh, more on the tokenized bank deposit evolution, as well as CBDCs as and when they become uh, more prevalent. Uh, so besides that research work, we also run a course for regulators and digital assets. We're about halfway through this eight-week course at the moment. Uh, we have 75 regulators from 25 different jurisdictions on uh, at the moment. Uh, and that covers everything from kind of blockchain basics up to uh, the final two weeks being on regulation and supervision around digital assets as well. Uh, so we're looking to expand that course out to non-regulators, hopefully in the middle of the year, based on the feedback we get from the regulators uh, in that respect. Uh, so kind of rapid uh, run round. Besides that, I'm also on the uh, Bank of England CBDC Technology Forum. Uh, so obviously in the UK, with the launch of the consultation paper, that's uh, quite an active uh, topic at the moment. Um, and I was also a judge at a hackathon that Barclays ran for CBDC, which uh, touches on some of the points we're talking about here, I think, in terms of positioning of um, tokenized bank deposits and CBDC as well. So I'll pause there. Thank you, Keith. Very interesting. Philip. Yeah, thank you very much as, again as, um, from Keith for the invitation to this, uh, this discussion. Um, so I'm Philip Ness. I head up business development for JP Morgan Coin Systems which is part of the Onyx organization. The Onyx organization is JP Morgan's focus on blockchain and emerging technologies. Um, and we've been very much focused on the blockchain landscape, you know, from the early days all the way through to today. And we now have three live networks that are over two years old, ranging from information sharing 
to exchange of value, which is the area that I'm focused on in JP Morgan Coin, through to an asset exchange in terms of um, US Treasury intraday repos on our own Onyx Digital Asset Network. And we have a R&D uh, unit as part of our organization. So we've been very active in this space for some time. Um, my particular focus is on JP Morgan Coin. As I mentioned, it's been live for over two years. We've had a significant number of transactions, something I think in the order of $430 billion um, to date across the network. That's two key areas. One is our core, core network and where we support our um, intraday repo network. Um, in addition to that, um, we have a number of other activities that we've focused on from the coin systems. So Partior, the uh, entity that's been stood up in Singapore with investment from DBS and the Sovereign Wealth Fund, Tomasek, and now Standard Charter Bank investing in you know, reimagining correspondent banking based on a, on a shared ledger basis. And JP Morgan Coin could be seen as a single bank ledger. So it's very much focused on JP Morgan's capabilities and JP Morgan's clients. And it is an account based solution today. So I must make that very clear. Um, in addition to that, we, you know, as we'll touch on, I guess, um, subsequently in the discussions, we're very much um, focused on programmability and leveraging smart contracts on blockchain on our activities as we go forward. And finally, and our, you know, a very significant focus on the core topic of today's discussion has been our uh, focus on deposit tokens and the work we've done with Project Gu uh, uh, Guardian, for example, here in Singapore with the MES, DBS and um, SBI. Um, and that's something that we, we see as the um, goal from where we are today, which is an account-based solution on a single bank JP Morgan client base, where we can bring efficiencies and capabilities um, to, do, to our own client base um, and leveraging the multi-bank capabilities with Partior and multi-currency capabilities of Partior. And then what we would see as the universal ledger, being able to use deposit tokens in the wider universe out there outside of our banking network. Um, and, and others. So that's our goal. That's what we're focused on and uh, looking forward to the rest of the, dis of the discussion. Thank you, Philip. Most interesting. So let's start with the deep questions now, but we'll, we're going to start with an introductory one, obviously. Tokenized deposits or deposit tokens are ra a ra rather new concept. Can you both give us your brief introduction into this new concept? Let's start with you, Philip. Yeah, I mean, interesting question. And when I saw this, I was kind of took a step back because from our perspective, we wouldn't necess necessarily see it as a new concept. What we see is this more of an evolutionary concept from where we are today with JP Morgan Coin, which is this account-based solution within, within the JP Morgan environment um, that brings significant benefits from our client base. So we can move funds seamlessly around, you know, our own infrastructure, 24 by 7, 365, with no cutoff times and enable our clients to, to leverage that capability. But we obviously realize that we need to extend into, a, into the external universe. I think the world has agreed that the, what the future is digital. You know, to some extent, we can all, all agree that that was accelerated by COVID-19. And we see that future, particularly in the traditional finance world of digitization, taking place at a very fast pace. So how do we accommodate those needs and move out of our current environment? So the logical conclusion uh, that we came to um, and the one that we're very um, interested in is the concept of deposit tokens where you're actually able to take an existing bank account as is today with all the features and functions of a bank account and we may touch touch on some of the benefits of that later and be able to then create a deposit token could, that, that can be, then effectively be externalized into other networks and used in for all intents and purposes cash like in other in other um uh, across other networks and that brings significant benefits um, that I'm sure we'll touch on as well around the ability for a seamless movement of funds seamless movement of assets delivery versus payment um, removal of settlement risk all become um, you know viable options in that in that space so that's where we see deposit tokens taking us to the next iteration um, it's not without its challenges um, you know it's it's early days and we see this as a long journey and we certainly see this as uh, maybe not the end state, because we're always evolving and changing, so we shouldn't say the end state, but the end state that we can see, you know, as far as we can see out in the, into the future with any clarity at this moment in time. Thank you, Philip. Very interesting, because uh, I was thinking, obviously, that as this as a new concept, but you mentioned it's like an evolution, and that's right. I mean, it's from the typical deposits to the digital deposits being exchangeable in a 
faster, easier way. That's true. Keith, your turn. <laughs> My turn. Uh, I think Phil uh, answered it very well. I mean, I'm not sure there's much more I can say other than to, and I guess we'll get into this in the next question, uh, other than to understand the positioning of what Phil just described against, uh, for example, the current state that we already have and all the friction and delays and costs associated with that versus stable coins versus CBDC. So I think we have the, you know, this is a, a res not new, as Phil said, but uh, in terms of the impact it's having, I think it's new uh, against those other uh, kind of forms of money that exist or will exist. Okay, so wrapping up, it's not new, it's an evolution. That's fine. Thank you. The third one. What are the main advantages or opportunities that arise with the deposit tokens and who will benefit the most from those? Let's start with you, Kim. Okay. Um, I mean, clearly, if we look at uh, the most prevalent form of digital money at the moment, uh, I guess, in terms of stable coins. It's interesting to look at deposit tokens and how they compare uh, to stable coins. So stable coins obviously have the notion of, a, of an issuer and then a reserve, a backing to the uh, stable coins that are issued and there's questions associated with the uh, the backing in terms of uh, its liquidity, its ability to be able to uh, provide redemptions, etc. And all of this translates into a relatively uncertain regulatory environment for that reason. Uh, so obviously, uh, a lot of jurisdictions don't currently have um, regulations to cover stable coins, but in many respects, uh, the, the regulatory post-FTX environment is... is uh, uh, beginning to focus on stable coins as one of the first stages. So, for example, Mika here in Europe, the market infrastructure for crypto assets, due to be voted on in uh, next month, uh, which if it comes into fruition, which I'm assuming it will do, I think it's around uh, May next year that the stable coin regulation is expected to arrive, uh, with the CASP regulation being later in 2024. Similarly, here in the UK, uh, as and when we see further regulation, it's likely to encompass stable coins fairly early on. Obviously, in the US and other and uh, MAS in Singapore, which Phil might want to comment on, likewise, uh, being quite uh, initially focused on stable coins. So I think uh, the regulatory environment and the regulatory differences between stable coins and tokenized bank deposits are one of the key benefits and differentiation in the sense that tokenized bank deposits, as Phil said, is uh, you know essentially providing a different form of what already exists in terms of fractional banking uh, within the commercial bank issuers as opposed to, and therefore largely being treated uh, under existing regulations, liquidity ratios, everything else associated with traditional uh, commercial banking regulation, as opposed to the new regulations that are likely to come out for stable coins, which are likely to look at the nature and liquidity of the backing, for instance, uh, the operational processes that are important to have in place, uh, especially at the time of stress, uh, the need to be able to show resilience um, along PFMI type principles, etc. So uh, rather long-winded answer, but I think the whole regulatory el element is one of the uh, key differentiators because it will be a much simpler path for tokenized bank deposits uh, than um, around uh, stable coins themselves. Um, obviously, there's uh, programmability benefits that Phil touched on. Uh, I think as the commercial banks uh, progress with tokenized bank deposits, there's an awful lot of innovation that is possible uh, on the back of that. Same could be said for CBDCs, but obviously token bank deposits are largely in the hands of the commercial banks as to how they address that, um, as JP Morgan are doing, and therefore, um, you know, subject to this easier path as far as regulation is concerned, are likely to see innovation realized more quickly as a result of that, I think. Um, should also say, I guess, that um, again, it'd be interesting here, uh, Phil's point of view on this, but most of the use for tokenized bank deposit at the moment tends to be on more of the institutional the wholesale side, like the intraday repo, etc., that Phil referred to, rather than retail. But obviously, in the case of stablecoins, uh, they have a you know a, a use across both retail in particular, given its start and starting point around facilitating uh, trading within crypto assets, uh, and somewhat less in wholesale. But obviously, there's an increasing interest, I think, from a wholesale perspective as well. So that's another kind of uh, differentiator, I think, in terms of uh, tokenized bank deposits versus uh, stable coins. But uh, I'll pause there because I'm sure Phil's got some views on this. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and thank you, Keith. And I probably concur with a number of the you know, items that you raised. I mean, from, from our perspective, you know, I, I continue with the theme of evolution. So we see this as an evolutionary phase. So how do we take people 
to the new digital domain of the future where we're starting with the traditional finance model that we have today and it's a journey that we have to take our clients along so you know we've had this conversation um historically if you believe in the new paradigm how do you get there how do you take along your clients that have been embedded you know and invested significantly in existing infrastructure in existing capabilities um, and it's not all about the just the um, the movement of the funds it's all about the reporting requirements etc and, and the um, transparency that you get into the process that SQL is important so from our perspective you know we, we see a few key things one you know obviously I think you've touched on these points but a bank deposit is you know from a banking perspective it doesn't change we're a highly regulated bank and other banks are highly regulated we operate in a highly regulated environment we go through significant stress testing on our balance sheet we have very diverse balance sheets therefore you know are able to to take stressful events to some extent or shock events we have operational resilience built into the solution as a regulatory requirement um, we have liquidity ratios that we have to adhere to and you know as a access to central bank money as, as a lender of last resort as well so to, to, to smooth out shocks in the system are all part of the value proposition or the proposition that um, deposit tokens bring um, and I would suggest there's a couple of key things that we focus on I, um, certainly from my personal perspective that I think differentiate deposit tokens and what we're trying to achieve in out there is um you know some of the challenges we can talk about um, in the friction in the in the payments world today, we can't solve. Regulation is regulation. AML law, KYC, anti-money, um, you know, uh, terrorist funding uh, regulation is out there. We can't actually change that. We we actually have to adhere to that. So the challenges that we can solve are significant, though, and I suggest they are, you know, pre-funding and settlement risk, and being able to remove pre-funding and settlement risk from the system, or as as a as a minimum, significantly reduce it. Is a, is a significant benefit to all the participants out there. Now, from a JP Morgan coin systems perspective, we, we sit in our CIB organization, so we're very much focused on our client base, which is large corporates, um, you know, financial institutions, non-bank financial institutions, et cetera. So building on Keith's point, very much the institutional space or the financial institutional space, along with large corporations. And we see benefits and use cases where deposit tokens will bring benefits to those participants. To some extent, we're less interested in retail, um, primarily because where we sit in the organization, if I'm honest. Um, but, but I would also add that, as we may touch on the central bank digital currencies going forward, you know, you might make the case for, for retail central bank digital currencies, wholesale central bank digital currencies, possibly. Um, but we are very much uh, of the view that commercial bank money, which I believe is uh, something like 90% of the money that exists out there in the world today, um, will continue to have a, a significant part to play. Now, maybe the percentages change over time, but it's certainly not going to go away. And what we've seen in the explosion in the last four or five years of digital assets is a net new economy. So a net new need for, for, for money to you know access for delivery versus payment etc so the the pie is getting bigger um so your percentage might slip but in actual value you're going to increase um so we certainly see um that capability and i re i reinforce um keith's point again around programmability because to some extent some of the things we we can do on deposit tokens we could do on any technology you know there's many technologies out there we may have may have been able to use but the ability to use programmability and then you know start with automation and then move on to smart automation and then move into some multi-consensus activity is where it gets really interesting and very different and frankly where you see business models changing now you know that that scares people that scares people in jp morgan you know if business models are changing what are, what are the implications of that but i think you know you embrace those changes um and you you adopt to the new business model um what we're trying to avoid is is, is looking at the same um Whilst I talk about the evolutionary story, what, what we don't want to end up is in a position where we have solutions for tomorrow based on just using a new technology for, for delivering what we did yesterday. Um, we actually want to fundamentally change things and, and change the you know change and improve the uh, model going forward. So that's what we're trying to drive towards here at JP Morgan. And deposit tokens clearly help that and they clearly allow us to be, you know, move outside our own organization. So as much as we would like everybody to bank with JP Morgan, it's probably unrealistic. Um, and therefore that we need to, to externalize our capabilities to the wider wider community. I think it's really interesting, Philip. And uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is that stablecoin is like 
profiting from lack of regulation. I mean, there's a lot of gray areas and you can do a lot of things just because of that. On the other hand, deposit tokens, it's uh, like standing on the shoulders of what we know is very well regulated as Philip highlighted, but including or, or trying to cope or to uh, challenge or to solve some of the problems that we already know and that Philip highlighted the settlement risk and uh, funding uh, and, and the pre-funding of, of positions and that Keith also mentioned the, the programmability. So those are like the perhaps three things that I would like to highlight from both answers uh, of, of you both. And uh, that obviously being on top of regulated deposits, regulated institutions obviously makes the things a little bit easier for, for everyone to start using them right away instead of waiting for some regulation. So thank you for this one. The next one is uh, there's obviously no free lunch. There, are, there should be risk associated with deposit tokens. Who is Which risk are we talking about and who is bearing those risks? Kid. I mean, as uh, Phil said, I think the, you know, the risks are essentially the same uh, as conventional commercial bank money and commercial bank accounts. Uh, so it comes down to the, uh, the risk associated with the commercial banking institution, which is uh, issuing the tokenized bank deposits. Uh, and the existing, uh, you know, very mature regulation that uh, uh, that is uh, dependent on which those organizations have to follow, including things that Phil mentioned in terms of liquidity ratios, risk management processes, et cetera, et cetera, um, which are well proven uh, over many, many years, it goes without saying. Uh, and that's uh, obviously a major differentiator, but it's still a risk. And whilst it may not be a huge risk in the case of JP Morgan as an issuer, Obviously, if smaller banks uh, issue um, tokenized bank deposits, uh, then it is dependent on the risk of those institutions as well. And obviously, in the current environment, we've some we've seen some smaller banks with, uh, you know, in this case, significant exposure to crypto assets, for instance, uh, that that have seen uh, withdrawals, you know, you know the impact on their balance sheets associated with uh, the uh, crypto winter that we're in at the moment. Uh, and institutions in that kind of position, obviously, uh, will have greater stresses in terms of uh, meeting their regulatory obligations. And, and therefore, uh, that's really where the major risk, I think, comes from in that respect. Uh, so essentially, at the end of the day, it's around the existing stability uh, and uh, uh, the kind of metrics that we know about liquidity management, etc., around the, the institution that is doing the issuing. Uh, the other risk I just flag uh, a couple of elements, I think. One is, as we've said already, uh, today it's largely about uh, institutions and uh, large corporates. Um, so it's not really a risk, but it is, you know, it's not yet serving uh, the retail part of the community uh, in any meaningful way. Um, so that, you know, they have therefore uh, isn't addressing that kind of element and that kind of opportunity directly. And that clearly is more of the focus of the retail CPTC initiatives that are uh, happening at the moment as well. And the other risk, again, not really a risk per se, but just like JP Moore, as Phil largely mentioned, you know, we're talking in the first instance of a, a single bank ledger like JP Morgan's ledger to support uh, tokenized bank deposits within the JP Morgan network in that respect. Um, we're then the big question then is to what extent that extends into shared ledgers to a greater uh, position, because that's really where the broader utility comes from in terms of being able to, you know, large corporates that have multiple bank relationships, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, Phil mentioned Partior as an example of that, and I think that's another key development. And until those multi-bank uh, shared ledger implementations happen, the utility is going to be relatively limited to individual bank networks. So it's not really a risk, but it's a kind of utility constraint until the expansion happens. And that expansion has, has been mooted by many people, including Augustine Carstens, the general manager of BIS, is that we go from this uh, individual bank ledger, as in the case of the JP Morgan coin, uh, the shared ledgers, you know, party or being a good example of that, to the universal ledgers, which then brings together the uh, commercial bank ledgers um, and also central bank ledgers in terms of CBDC. Uh, and whilst that universal ledger model might be some far way out, uh, you know, we can see this steady progression, I think, from what we see today with the JP Morgan coin, what we see already with Partior as an example of a shared ledger. And uh, in particular, the strongest representation, I think, of the universal ledger model is obviously RLN, uh, the regulatory, regulatory <laughs> regulated liability network, uh, which the Fed is uh, um, running a pilot at the moment with a number, number of commercial banks. Uh, you know, full respect to Citibank for their uh, driving innovation as far as this is concerned. 
Uh, but that illustrates what the ultimate target may be, I think, as we go through this progression, bringing together uh, tokenized bank deposits, as we talked about here, and CBDCs in a meaningful way. Thank you, Keith. That's great. Let's go to the next one. There are not many live cases of deposit tokens. The JP Morgan coin single bank layer system is one of them. And, and Philip already mentioned it at the beginning of, 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 our, of our broadcast. Philip, can you briefly explain how it works and how it has enhanced operational efficiency for JP Morgan and its clients? Absolutely. Uh, but the first thing I should say, JP Morgan coin today is not in our terms a deposit token. It's, it's actually an account-based solution, which we just record a deposit of, a, of, of a, a deposit with JP Morgan on a blockchain deposit account or a BDA account. So it's a deposit that we record. So we view deposit tokens very differently in terms of actually tokenizing the deposit and then externalizing it. In this case, it remains within JP Morgan and always will remain, you know, the balance will always remain within JP Morgan. So JP Morgan coin today has been live for two and a half years. We did run the uh, controlled experiment with the MAS and others, as I mentioned, under Project Guardian, where we issued Singapore dollars, exchanged those on the uh, Polygon protocol um, for, for Japanese yen, and then reversed that transaction out later in the day in a, on a live distributed finance network. So we've experimented with it, but at the end of that, I think the, um, the head of the um, MAS uh, in innovation infrastructure described that, you know, as always, it raised more questions than it answered. So there are a number of questions around deposit tokens going forward, not around the technology, frankly, or the operational capabilities. You know, we, I can kind of prove that and they've been well proven. It's more around the KYC, I am ongoing KYC assessment. Um, you know, we, we use verifiable credentials, but how does that roll out our scale out going forward? It's okay in a controlled environment where all the players are well known, but how do you then roll that out going, going, going forward? And the other challenge is obviously fungibility, I think, which Keith touched on, fungibility of these deposit tokens, because, you know, we absolutely understand that there's a need for fungibility, but how does that take place? How do we remove the risks of, of fungibility, given that some of these assets are effectively a you know, issued by different entities that have different uh, risk, risk exposures um, from a depositor. So just reinforcing the point um, Keith made on the last uh, uh, point, it, you know, ultimately the risk is with the owner of the, of the token. Um, so, and therefore, you know, it's a, but what I would say to that is commercial bank risk assessment, there's very good frameworks out there to assess commercial bank risk and make a judgment call on your appetite for certain, um, you know, risk exposure to a certain bank and, and also, you know, limits on where your exposure should exist today, and that can be replicated. So again, we're just building on existing controls um, to, to be able to move forward. But from the JP Morgan perspective, the, the JP Morgan blockchain deposit account today is, is very simple. Uh, the gatekeeping uh, um, to the, having a blockchain deposit account is having an existing relationship with JP Morgan. So you have to be an account holder with JP Morgan. Um, we just move funds from an existing account to a blockchain deposit account in the origination country, we then move it to the destination country on a blockchain deposit account, and then we can move the funds into uh, an existing account for productive use of those funds. The key difference from our class today compared to our current capabilities is that we can do that 24 by 7, 365, no cutoff times. And as we're layering on top of that automation, we can make seamless automation um, around simple things such as uh, conditional payments, for example, and then scheduling of payments and or trigger events um, around events that maybe um, trigger a payment downstream. All this is net new capability, and we can deliver that to clients today based on, based on our, our existing capability within JP Morgan Coin. And as we move to the deposit world, we would look to enrich that and obviously extend outside the JP Morgan environment. That's really a very nice introduction introduction and explanation of, of, of uh, the JP Morgan coin. Philip, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next one. I read from the German Banking Association a paper which is really interesting about uh, tokenized deposits in which they regard those deposit tokens as complementary to CBDCs. That's something that Keith uh, perhaps has, has mentioned that uh, perhaps deposit tokens has to do more with corporate clients whereas uh, retail CBDCs are more like for the public, I mean, firms and, and individuals, but they find, or they mention that deposit tokens are an answer to stable coins issued by non-banks. What do you think about this view about what uh, deposit tokens are? Kip. 
Yeah, I, I think part of that uh, comment comes from uh, the fact that stable coins, uh, certainly as indicated by the BIS, uh, have uh, an import uh, imported their credibility from the fiat banking system, the central banking system in that respect. And because stable coins, uh, to varying extents, run a risk of losing their peg, uh, and we've seen multiple examples of that, obviously calamitously with uh, Terra, but also other stable coins have, uh, at the time of significant market disruption, have lost their peg as well, and therefore um, lost their ability to what the BIS call the si uh, singleness of money, i.e. Uh, a divergence. Uh, between the value of a stable coin versus uh, the fiat uh, position from the central bank and from the commercial banking environment. And the beauty, obviously, of the traditional financial system is uh, we have we do have a, a very highly effective <clears throat> a singleness of money in the sense that fiat, uh, be it central bank money or commercial bank money, which, as Phil said, is 90% uh, of uh, funds in circulation, uh, is always the same. It's always a redeemable par in that respect. Uh, so there is a, a significant difference between stable coins in that kind of context and both CBDC and commercial bank money, be it in tokenized banking for banking deposits or in conventional uh, commercial bank money as well. Um, so, you know, stable coins have that risk. Stable coins have been, uh, you know, growing. Obviously, uh, market cap is, uh, is a bit lower in the context of the uh, crypto winter, but, you know, up to that point have been growing and potentially are finding new use cases in terms of payments, for instance, um, where I uh, read a paper from Circle, for example, which was talking about uh, an 80% reduction in cost associated with using stable coins, uh, USDC in this case, uh, in terms of international payments, for instance. Uh, so that's more of a retail use case rather than, than an institutional use case, but it illustrates this balance of utility versus uh, risk associated with stable coins. Um, so I think the kind of comments from the German Banking Association and the BIS um, illustrate uh, the risk associated with stable coin maturity because of that fact that the, it doesn't necessarily represent the singleness of money, has to import its credibility from the traditional banking system. And... Uh, the way of managing that risk, especially a stablecoin utility and stablecoin market cap, gets to be of a systemic importance. But then uh, the natural response to that is the evolution and growth of tokenized bank deposits together with CBDCs, which represent this combined tokenized future digital economy, if you like, representing both uh, central bank money and commercial bank money in a, a relatively easy to use and tokenized kind of form, which can support future economic requirements without the risks associated with stable coins. Now, I'm sure uh, there are some stable coin issuers would take exception to that, uh, looking to be regulated, uh, looking to uh, take on all the obligations associated with that regulation uh, to demonstrate that they can uh, have an effective peg, et cetera, uh, and therefore that risk is uh, limited, but others obviously may not be in such a, a great position for various reasons, and that will, you know, cause some kind of fragmentation maybe within the stablecoin market, as the different forms of regulation uh, emerge, as uh, we touched on earlier. Uh, but I'll, I'll pause there because I'm sure Phil's got some additional comments on this question. No, 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 not particularly, Keith. I think you've, read, you've you've covered it very well. But but I think um, just a couple of things I would add. You know, we obviously focus on on the peg being broken. Um, we never of, we don't very often focus on the inbound flows and the inbound flows uh, potential to disrupt. You know the assets they're investing in, um, you know, ca causing um, you know interest rates, short-term interest rates to, to move lower than they they would normally based on an inflow into a stable coin, for example, in significant volume. So I think the the kind of um, distortion effects that they have, both inbound and outbound, uh, are potentially create unnecessary risks. But the key the key areas I think we focus on is the scale. How can you scale stable coins? Uh, the scalability of stable coins without taking on undue risk to the financial system and, and those issues I mentioned around, you know, uh, where do they invest uh, that money to, to make a commercial return? And I'll touch on that again around the commercial side. But that scalability just isn't there in our mind. We, we, you know, to be able to scale to the level we want to globally, then we probably need deposit tokens and commercial bank money. That's what, you know, that's out there today. And for all the reasons we discussed around the diversified balance sheets, et cetera, the ability to make long-term investments on that balance sheet uh, versus short-term investments all make sense for a scalability perspective. But the other area I would touch on is that commercial model. The commercial model at the outset of stable coins, there was you know, probably an opportunity to charge fees for transactions 
that gave a significant return. But as they shrink, as they do naturally in any, any mature market, margins shrink. You know, where, where, did, where does the uh, stablecoin issuer make money? Um, and from JP Morgan's perspective, you know, we might make money from our fractional reserve model, you know, uh, the standard banking model that's well established and understood. Um, if you're chasing returns on invested assets, clearly as margins shrink, you're encouraged or forced to some extent to chase yield or returns, which normally means you chase riskier assets or, or place riskier bets. So it inherently is flawed in that in, from the outset that that risk is difficult to mitigate against whilst maintaining a commercial construct for the stablecoin issuer. So over time, as that scales and as margins shrink, you know, they'll still be there. They're not going to go away and people will have their you know, they'll have their place, but will they scale to the size of, of you know, the, the traditional finance world and the commercial banks? Probably highly unlikely is our, our perspective. That's a very interesting point because I remember at some point of time that many people was wondering how easy is for uh, stable coins to scale because it's not that easy to get all the collateral that they were claiming that they were putting it into their portfolios to support the stable coins. And they were wondering, well, what kind of collateral are we talking about? This really high quality, I mean, great quality market risk quality uh, collateral, or is something else that we're not seeing here? So that's really interesting because the scalability is also uh, bounded because of what can you put in the portfolio to support the peg at the end? And I and think that, the, the other, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, the, the other point there for is regulation. So at the moment, you know, largely most stable coins aren't necessarily under any significant regulation. And therefore they have liberty in terms of, to Phil's point, uh, investing in higher yield, but lower liquidity assets in that respect. And what we can see from uh, example, uh, the MAS consultation at the moment, uh, which is putting specific limits in terms of uh, the nature of the uh, backing in that respect, in terms of the high liquidity uh, and cash, uh, but to Bill's point, that will reduce uh, the return on stablecoin issuers increasingly. So, you know, that may not have been the case pre-regulation. It will be the, probably the case post-regulation, and that will be a further constraint as far as uh, return is concerned, especially for the, any institutions that insist on full cash backing, in which case, you know, it's already starts off as a potentially a loss, may, well, you know, who knows, uh, but not necessarily the high kind of returns that might have existed with less liquid uh, backing in that respect. True, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that without regulation, perhaps there will be, or there is a uh, race to bottom in the sense of what asset I'm going to put into to, to, to support the peg and what I'm going to disclose to the public. And that's perhaps the reason why they are not able to disclose everything so easily. That's yeah. that's a good that's a good discussion, I guess. Which, by the way, is the focus of our digital money dashboard is being able to plug into things like the audits and uh, reserve composition that is reported by stablecoin issuers to get an understanding of what that is, uh, and hopefully, you know, increase understanding and insight as to the nature of stablecoin issuance as well. Yeah, because so far it's at the station, not, know, not I, much audit. Yeah, I, I mean, would add one point. I mean, I think it's also we don't necessarily focus on the volatility of the underlying assets. And as we saw recently in the UK with the gilt market, where you know traditional stable government bonds um, came under some pressure and had significant volatility, and that was nothing to do potentially with a stable coin investment, but something completely different. But that you know they would have been affected by that as that volatility took place on those underlying assets. So it is that you know distribution or portfolio distribution that's important in terms of the assets that they can invest in that that, that can, can can withstand such shocks. So I think you know that it's the unintended consequences. Yeah that I think we're always focused on. And I think that has to do with something that, I, that term that I always, always uh, use in this kind of collateralized specs, which is uh, the importance of having that the collaterals are information invariant. I mean, the, the better, the, the most information invariant the collateral is, obviously the peg works better. And uh, if the, the lowest the quality, the less information invariant the collateral becomes. And that's the whole point of it. So let's go to the next one. Uh, it has to do with something that Keith already mentioned about uh, BIS U or, or, or on FMIs, and it has to do with the uh, BIS regards stablecoin users as FMIs because they perform very broadly a transfer function. By parallel, parallel should licensed depository institutions issuing deposit tokens be considered FMIs too, or should be they be regulated as bank institutions only? Philip, what do you think? 
Um, I can only represent my personal view on this, so I wouldn't necessarily yeah. want to say this is JP Morgan's perspective because I'm sure there's a, you know, a larger number of people looking at this um, than myself. But from my personal perspective, purely based on the evolutionary story, you know, I suggest that we want to be regulated by a traditional regulator because that's well understood. They understand the risks. They understand everything. You know, they have great visibility into JP Morgan's activities, etc. So that framework exists and that trust exists. And therefore, why would you want to move into another regulator where there would be some period of transition, um, some maybe lack of knowledge, etc. Whereas in this particular case, I believe it's very, you know, it's, it just makes sense to stay with the same regulator. And certainly from our perspective today, we've been very clear what we're doing within JP Morgan Coin is a payment and, and is regulated by the OCC, our current regulator. So we, we wouldn't expect that to change and wouldn't want that to change from, from, from the JP Morgan Coin network perspective, uh, because we think that framework exists very well today. Kip. Yeah, I agree very much with what Phil was saying. I mean, the regulations, as we said earlier, for commercial banks are well tried and trusted in that respect. And essentially, uh, you know, going back to the same business, same risk, same regulation uh, argument, you know, all we're talking about is, uh, you know, tokenized bank deposits or the account model that Phil was referring to is, you know, essentially is the same business, same risk, same regulation story in that respect. So I think uh, the banking regulation is perfectly applicable in that respect. Uh, the other side of the coin, I think, is on stable coins, uh, obviously, um, where there are arguments, I think, in terms of uh, having the confidence from a regulatory point of view that stable coin issuers are able to effectively handle redemption, especially at moments of stress, uh, and therefore have the appropriate levels of security, the appropriate levels of operational resilience, maturity of operational processes, etc., in order to be able to maintain their peg and be able to manage redemptions in a timely manner. Uh, associated in particular, uh, as I said, in moments of stress. And that potentially has much closer um, uh, alignment to what the PFMI uh, kind of requirements are in terms of FMIs and what they need to do in terms of recovery. Those kind of things aren't obviously in place at the moment, but they do give a strong indication, I think, of what the direction of travel is likely to be uh, as far as the more significant stablecoin issues are concerned. So again, it comes back to what we've touched on before. I think a, a bit about divergence uh, in terms of uh, what tokenized bank deposits are, are essentially doing with all the benefits they've got under the existing regulatory envelope uh, versus stable coins and obviously the growth and the benefits that they've uh, generated over time, but now coming under greater regulatory scrutiny and these kind of things are likely to uh, put more structure and rigor in terms of the regulatory framework, including uh, the kind of principles you might expect from an FMI perspective. Thank you, Keith and Philip. The last one is a very usual question, but we always do it the broadcast, and it has to do with the future. Uh, in five years, how do you see this horse race between CBDCs, stable coins, and deposit tokens? And then we'll switch to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Keith, okay, let's start. if I kick off, yeah. Uh, I mean, as Albert Einstein said, I never think of the future where it comes soon enough. I think that's uh, a fair, fair point. Uh, so I think it's really hard to answer that question, obviously, and that's one of the reasons why, from a Cambridge point of view, they were building the digital money dashboard to try and give uh, greater insights as to how this evolution is actually happening uh, between stable coins, between uh, tokenized bank deposits and uh, CBDC, because we find it, from an academic point of view, a fascinating topic as to how this will uh, evolve, and the more information insight we can provide for that innovation, uh, the greater it will be. Um, I think the direction of travel is very clear, and we've touched on you know, many of the aspects of that evolution at the moment, what the opportunities are, where the risks are. Uh, so I think the direction is very clear. The only significant variable, I think, is just how long it will take uh, to establish an effective balance between stable coins, which I'm sure will continue to exist, um, but in a you know, more regulated and potentially different kind of form in terms of utility tokenized bank deposits, which we're likely to see, you know, a continuing evolution of, as uh, Phil said, uh, the multi-bank um, versions of that, shared ledgers and, and that kind of context, uh, if and when those kind of models will have an impact on the retail environment. And then obviously CBDCs, where, you know, we're, I was interested to see the Bank of England statement a few days ago, which saw it more likely that a CBDC would be implemented in the UK than not. Uh, and there seems to be similar flavors to that in uh, Europe, et cetera, going on at the moment. Uh, so again, the CBDC direction of travel, I think is relatively clear. 
but how these things will actually interact in you know, five years time down the line when we're likely to see more CBDC in the wild. I think that's a really interesting question. So I think the direction is clear, time scale less clear, uh, but I think it's going to be a fascinating journey. Thank you, Keith. And from my perspective, I mean, I think there's a couple of points I'd make, um, you know, assuming a level playing field, because obviously the playing field can be uh, skewed in favour of uh, one, one um, uh, thing or another. And additionally, you know, what do we, what do we mean by central bank digital currencies? Are we talking wholesale? Are we talking retail, et cetera, in, in their context? But I think I fundamentally agree with what Keith has just said. And our view is we don't necessarily see it as choices being made in winners and losers. It's just the hybrid world in terms of, you know, what what percentage of the share of the pie are you, you, you are taking from a CDBC, a deposit token or a stable coin perspective. And, you know, they'll move up and down based on use cases and activity over time. Uh, but we certainly see them being either that hybrid world or all of them have their, their use. All of them will have their use cases. Um, and I, I suggest the real challenge is, is the ability to interoperate between them. How do we exchange between them is going to be the challenge of tomorrow. But going forward, I, you know, we, we could all see them coexisting, um, you know, ab absolutely. And, you know, from a CDBC side, my personal view, you know, I, I would expect that to be quite fragmented. Uh, we can see that the different models out there are emerging are quite fragmented, probably along geopolitical lines um, in terms of how they operate and, and how they're used, etc. So I wouldn't necessarily say that when we talk about central bank digital currencies, we're talking about a seamless version of some unit that's... that's ubiquitous to, to, to everybody. Actually, there'll be different flavors of central bank digital currencies with their own attributes and, and uh, uh, um, specific requirements that we'll, we'll see going forward. But I mean, I, just to- uh, Absolutely, uh, sorry, 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 go ahead. Uh, Please go I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, uh, but just to pick up on your last comment on fragmentation. I mean, there is certainly a risk of that fragmentation, I think, and you know, we can see it to an extent at the moment. Uh, but obviously, BIS is heavily focused on pulling together, well, innovation hubs, for instance, that are sitting in Singapore, in the UK, in Basel, in, in Switzerland, etc., uh, all um, working towards a common picture in terms of how CBDC deployment might happen, sharing best practice, sharing standards, and the MCBDC initiative, uh, obviously, which uh, has also been running, uh, also points the way, I think, as to how we can reduce that fragmentation in CBDC deployment. So I agree the risk is very much there, but you know, all credit to the BIS to try and uh, facilitate best practice amongst central banks in terms of reducing that risk of fragmentation. That's great. Thank you, Keith and uh, Philip. We're going to turn now to the uh, questions from the audience. And I have several that I would like to, to address very quickly. The first one, are tokenized deposits similar to e-money in the sense of the European Union electronic money, regu electronic money regulation? It seems so a little bit. What do you think? You can take that, Phil. Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, actually, we, we, we might take a diff different view to that. We actually see a significant difference between e-money um, and deposit tokens. Deposit tokens are classical commercial bank money, fractional reserve money. It's not e-money, and we would make that distinction um, from our perspective. So I think it's more likely, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, that stablecoin might be under e-money regulation in that respect, uh, because it is different yeah. to um, commercial bank uh, issued deposit tokens. C correct. That's, that's the direction of travel for stable coins coming under the e-money regulation. And, um, you know, e-money certainly here in Singapore is, 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 is quite restrictive in terms of um, the, 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 uh, the monies that you have to set aside. So, you know, that, I think that'll be a significant difference uh, going forward. So we may want to Excellent. say, just to, oh. just to finish on uh, RLN, which we talked about before, I think that sees the scope of what the RLN potential is, is encompassing uh, e-money initiatives as well as stable coins and as well as uh, tokenized bank deposits and CBDCs. Thank you, Keith. Next one. Are deposit tokens a way for banking institutions to avoid potential disintermediation pushed forward by CBDCs and stable coins? I think on, on that, uh, bank disintermediation is obviously a risk uh, for uh, in terms of CBDC issuance, but you know, primarily within the retail context. Uh, and as we've talked about the what we're seeing at the moment in terms of uh, JP Morgan coin and other bank issued uh, token deposits, uh, deposit tokens, I should say, uh, really is focused on wholesale and institutional use. So there is a difference at the moment. 
so I'm not sure personally that uh, it will make significant impact as far as the retail CBDC disintermediation risk is concerned. But Phil, you have a view on that, I'm sure. No, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, Keith. I mean, I think at the retail end, and you've probably seen that in some geographies where that's disintermediation has already taken place. And I think, you know, that's um, probably China's a great example of that where private entities, you know, took over the, uh, uh, the retail space. Um, so, you know, not very much focused on the institutional domain. Uh, don't necessarily see disintermediation. You know, it's clearly a risk. And one of the reasons JP Morgan is focused on this activity and, and investing significantly in it is obviously to make sure we're not disintermediated and working with our clients to, to ensure that we're meeting their future needs and taking them on that journey as we go forward. But it's absolutely a risk and you know something we're aware of and something we're trying to address. Thank you, Philip. Next one. Would a tokenized deposit be considered liquidity by the regulators in the same way as fiat deposits are now? So are they going to be considered like a high quality liquid assets for all regulatory purposes? Phil? Um, again, absolutely, but the answer yes. I mean, we don't see any difference. That's the kind of main rationale. These are these are bank deposits under the banking model as it as that today, fractional reserve in a highly regulated framework. Um, we would not see any any difference to change um, you know, the treatment of them going forward. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how are these tasks of commercial banks changing with deposit tokens? And, and if there is new regulation that should be uh, included for, 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 for this issuance of deposit tokens? I mean, just to give a couple of responses to that, I think uh, Phil already mentioned programmability, for instance. So what are the new uh, facilities and new innovations that can be delivered using uh, tokenized bank deposits and tying it into other digital asset or other kind of asset transactions um, in that kind of context? So I think there's a, you know, a world of possibility associated with that, which represents an opportunity for commercial banks in terms of uh, deposit token issuance. And as we said already, you know, essentially, uh, the only thing required from a regulatory point of view is just confirmation or clarity. Uh, for example, uh, I see the chat you put in the MAS consultation. That's a very good example, I think, of uh, providing that regulatory clarity around tokenized bank deposits, which is expected to be uh, you know, very, very limited in terms of any obligations other than the traditional banking regulation that we talked about. Um, so I, in my view, I don't think any new regulation is necessary at all. Uh, clarification or confirmation as to how this may be treated in this particular example, like the MAS example, uh, is likely to happen, but it's unlikely to bring about any significant new obligations on the part of uh, commercial banks. Okay, the last one. We have one more minute before the hour, and it's the following. We talked about the credit risks uh, raised by, deposit by depositors keeping tokenized deposits, and that's like counterparty risk of, of, of this uh, form of money. Is there any other risks such as technology risk uh, associated with tokenized bank deposits? Is something to care about or to want to to, to mind about this? Bill? Um, from, yeah, sure. From our perspective, yes, it's a risk um, and the one that we focus on and address. You know, part of our regulatory requirement is to have secure, robust, um, resilient infrastructure. And that's no different from whether we're running a, a blockchain based or DLT based network, um, as opposed to anything else that we run as a bank. So from that perspective, to Keith's point earlier, the same activity, same regulation, you know, that's there in place, the requirements are there. And to some extent, I'd suggest that's again, you know, just feeding back into the difference maybe between deposit tokens and privately issued stable coins, etc, that we, we have that level of focus, even around our infrastructure and oper operational resilience in place on an ongoing basis, both of a firm-wide and, and as an industry-wide perspective. And therefore that, um, you know, that, that, that is already in place and we're just reflecting that and those requirements, both externally and our own internal best practices as we go forward. I don't know if there's that's anything you want to add to that, Keith? No, no, that's fine. Okay, Keith and uh, Philip, thank you very much. That's a wrap. We have finished our FMI broadcast number nine. Thank you all for joining. And thank you, Keith and, and Philip, for joining us as, as guest speakers. You will find in the slides, if anyone wants to contact uh, Keith or Philip via LinkedIn or their websites of Cambridge Digital Asset for Regulators Online Program or uh, JP Morgan, it will be provided in the slides. Please take into account that coming up next, March 9, we'll have subtech broadcast number four, 
with uh, Accenture and Oliver Wyman. March 22nd, we're going to have CBDC broadcast number 15 with the Digital Dollar Project and MIT. And on April, we're going to have some other uh, events with some of, of other uh, guest speakers. So thank you all for joining. It's 8 a.m. in Colombia. Have a, uh, have a very nice morning or the rest of the day, depending on the part of the world you're at. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Thank Philip. You. Have a nice Thank day. You. And you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.